Welcome back. Another episode of Tate's Take. And in fact, the 24th episode of Tate's Take. And uh, of course, you know, that's where basketball lives. Appreciate everybody for checking in with us on today. Of course, we got a special guest for you on the day. Um, but before we get to that and get ready to introduce him, that'll be coming sometime within the next five to 10 minutes. Jay Billis, college basketball analyst for CBS Sports, as well as uh, for ESPN. Now that we know exactly um, which players are going to uh, declare for, have declared officially for the NBA draft, as we know that the uh, withdrawal deadline was uh, is today. So I believe today, five o'clock P, of course, that being uh, Eastern Standard Time as well. Um, really excited to have him on to kind of talk about some players that are going to be coming back to school, uh, some players that um, are deciding not to return back to school and foregoing their eligibility for the collegiate level and obviously looking to uh, make some dreams come true of their own. So, you know, I'm really excited to hear Jay's perspective. And before he comes on, I'm going to give you guys a little bit uh, of my perspective as well Welcome as it regards to how I feel about, you know, some of the players, um, what it means for some of the um, programs that, you know, some of these players are coming back to and so forth. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that I go ahead and mention that and just a few other things that we are going to uh, be talking about is, you know, obviously the landscape of college basketball right now and, um, you know, the status of it and some of the concerns that we have. And I know I definitely have quite a few of my own. I'm sure that Jay has some of his own as well. Uh, and even outside of that, how much of the uh, current what we're seeing in the NBA right now in terms of their success how much of that is going to rely heavily on, you know, what the NFL, what college football, what uh, maybe uh, college basketball will look like if there will even be a season? Because I've always been that person that went on and said, you know what, the reality of it is this. If this whole thing with the NBA falls through and fails, then it doesn't seem realistic like the chances of any of the sports being played. Uh, especially the ones that are outside of basketball, being football, baseball, maybe some others. Uh, and, and I'm curious to know how it appeals to the eye of a lot of people if you don't have the fans. And I think that the NBA obviously did a significantly good job um, with putting players in a bubble, secluding them away from so many other people, putting you know virtual fans in the stance and kind of giving it as much of a – uh, home court feel or home court advantage or true uh, NBA, you know, in or in the arena feel as possible as when we're watching it on TV versus what we're seeing now. Because, you know, right now it, it kind of seems uh, or the one of the concerns rather that I thought that we were going to see was the NBA probably, um, you know, looking at it like the NBA would um, have it seem like it was more of like a uh, AAU atmosphere or like a summer league atmosphere. And I think that they did a phenomenal job with it so far. So we're going to get into some of that, how the NBA um, landscape and how we've been seeing how successful they've been, how what kind of effect that'll have on other sports, even more so on top of that, what are some of the pros and the cons of the NBA bubble and kind of how this thing is working in their favor? And last but certainly not least, uh, the ruling by the NCAA, um, the athletes' financial stability with the name of image and likeness, having that opportunity, how that affects the G League, amongst other things with players coming back uh, from uh, deciding how they're going to withdraw, if they're going to withdraw or not. I think they got to a five o'clock. We're going to bring Billis on so we can ask him a couple of those questions. That's why we got the man on. Let's get ready to bring him on from uh, an analyst, college basketball analyst from ESPN, Jay Billis. Had the pleasure to meet you some years ago. I'm going to bring that photograph up here pretty soon, but I definitely want to let you know I really, really appreciate you for coming on here with me today to talk some good hoops. Yeah, my pleasure. Good to be with you, Deshaun. 
I appreciate it very much. And I want to let the people know real quick, you can follow along on social media at Tate's Take Hoops, T-A-T-E-S-T-A-K-E-H-O-O-P-S on all social media platforms, as well as make sure that you go and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, as well as um, anywhere that you find your favorite uh, podcast. So let's get ready to bring up Jay's um, lower third here. Appreciate him for coming on. Uh, first and foremost, I definitely want to get into quite a bit of college basketball with you, but first and foremost, some NBA stuff. How has this, what has been working for the NBA in terms of putting these guys in a bubble? It seems like it's been extremely successful so far. There hasn't been any positive tests from the players uh, in regards to the NBA. What exactly, what key ingredient or what kind of secret ingredient have they had on making this a successful thing? Well, it's basically the bubble itself to be able to quarantine the players and keep them away from community spread. So when you don't have any case, you can see what, what's going on with Major League Baseball, how difficult it is to, to have a season when you know, you've got uh, spread within a team and then they play another team and you've got uh, you know umpires and, and all that stuff. There are a lot of moving parts when you're going to travel uh, to that extent, which I think should should ring some alarm bells for college football and college basketball, given the amount of travel those sports have to undertake. Uh, but the NBA has been the most thoughtful uh, and they've put in place like when, when, when the Bundesliga in Germany uh, was playing, playing soccer, uh, you know, the NBA had all their protocols and shared information and was able to use those protocols in order to, to uh, fashion their own and did an extraordinary job. So look, it's still early. They've only played a few games, mm -hmm. but for them to be there for a period of weeks, I think the hard part is, you know, as we go further along, there are going to be a number of teams that are going to have to be with, in that bubble for uh, months. And, you know, we're going to get to October and you're still going to have, uh, you know, at least two teams, maybe four or six that are still going to be there uh, through the playoffs. And that's a long time uh, mm -hmm. to be to be in that setting. And so, you know, there may be other issues that pop up. Who knows? For sure. And, you know, what I'll say this, I've just kind of always been under the impression that, you know, depending on how successful the NBA will be, may potentially, you know, have an effect on uh, how the other organizations will kind of mimic what the NBA is trying to do. I can only imagine how hard it'll be for China, you know, put the football thing in a bubble or something crazy like that. And of course, I don't want to, you know, limit any of the ideas that they may potentially have. But do you think that the NBA's success, that that weight um, that it holds, you know, that 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 could possibly determine how successful some of the other leagues are going forward? Well, it let it, only if they do the same thing, and I, it doesn't look like the NFL is going to try to do that. They're they're going to have they got you know much bigger rosters, and and they're gonna they're gonna try to run their season the way they normally do. Now there may be different protocols than they would normally have. Uh, they're certainly not going to be able to have a you know all their um, their meetings together. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to keep your quarterbacks separate. You're not gonna have a, a quarterback room where you're gonna have all your quarterbacks together because if one of them gets it, then they're all out of commission. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're gonna have to change the way they do some things. Um, I, I do think you're gonna see uh, in college a uh, attempts by different leagues and or schools to separate and isolate their teams from the rest of the student population. Um, that's just the only smart way to do it. That that otherwise, you know, you're trying to take this multi-billion dollar business and you're you're making it, you know, you're flipping a coin and crossing your fingers as to whether you're going to have spread within a team. And the one problem that we've had, and, and this is a societal issue, but it's also with regard to uh, to our sports, is that we've not had the hard conversations about one, what risk are we willing to take here, and mm -hmm. and on whom are we placing that risk. And, and two, um, what are the metrics we're going to use? And, and when do we say enough? Like how many cases is too many? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, what, what, how are we going to determine that? What metrics as to, uh, Hey, if you test positive on Friday, you're not playing for two weeks, whatever it is. Um, uh, and, and what are the metrics for pulling the plug? Are we just going to do it by feel? Um, I think that's what a lot of the what a lot of the players want to know, and and certainly what I would like to know, 
And then also these, all these institutions have some of the best infectious disease experts uh, and virologists in, in the world. And every commissioner said, well, we're talking with our scientists. And, well, what are they saying? Right. You know, right. would you mind sharing that with us? We'd like mm -hmm. to know. And mm -hmm. all of these institutions take federal funds. So I mm -hmm. think it's a public trust. So I'd like to know what they're saying. And, and have they stepped forward? Like they talk about education all the time. Have they stepped forward to help educate the public? And the answer has been no. Let me say this, Jay, and I, obviously you're extremely, extremely intelligent. One of the things that I respect the most is that, you know, you, you, you're not afraid to go out and say how you really feel about some of these matters. You put it out there on the forefront and you make it known and, and you're very direct uh, with, you know, the things that you're saying. And I think that some of the things which you're saying is very important. Like you said, it's going to be a matter of trust and, and uh, the fact that, you know, you have all of these uh, different scientists and different people. And I don't know really what's going on behind closed doors. None of us in a sense kind of really do, but uh, for the ones that do, you know, there's going to be questions uh, that need to be answered moving forward. And I also wanted to ask you about, you know, the opportunity that NCAA athletes have now at uh, having an opportunity to, you know, get a little bit of, of, of money for their image and for name, image and likeness. And obviously the NCAA just now passing that ruling not long ago. How does that exactly affect uh, the G League, which seems to be the new wave, I guess, for a lot of athletes who um, are looking to, you know, go to the NBA and play on the highest level, uh, but coming out of high school, maybe, uh, you know, deterring that option of going and playing college and instead going to make a little bit of money uh, from the G League, because I can't imagine that that would be the case for every single player. They're all not going to get the same amount. We saw Jalen Green, $500,000 here, other players, three hundred k. How exactly does that have an effect, being the, uh, the name, image, image and likeness, how exactly does that have an effect on the G League and what they do moving forward? Well, I don't think it's going to have any effect that, first of all, the NCAA has said they're open to the idea of name, image, and likeness as long as it fits within the collegiate model. And that really means that it's like saying uh, we want the players to have unlimited showers as long as nobody gets wet. <laughs> you know, that they're not going to allow this. And that's why they're before Congress right now asking for an antitrust exemption so that Congress can give them cover uh, to limit it um, to, to basically next to nothing. And so it really all this is going to do, um, you know, the G League will be an option going forward and it may be a good option for a number of players. And that I think that'll grow and it'll be become a bigger trend. That's not going to bother the NCAA at all. They want those players out. They're not interested in having one and done players anymore, uh, because even though they've benefited to the tune of, of mil billions of dollars, frankly, uh, from the best players, uh, if they, they really believe that if they can get rid of the Zion Williamson's of the world and not have them in college at all, that takes away part of the argument for the players being compensated. Uh, I think they're wrong there. I think whoever mm -hmm. it, it's like, it's like saying, well, Brad Stevens and, uh, Billy Donovan went to the NBA. Therefore we, we shouldn't have to pay the coaches as much. That's mm -hmm. nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. And, and, you know, people get paid based upon their, not only their value, but on revenue generation. And so the players generate a tremendous amount of revenue. They deserve to share in it and they deserve to take advantage of their name, image and likeness rights. And so, you know, people who say, well, they're getting a scholarship and I'd love to trade places with it. Well, to whom else do you say such a thing? Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love to trade places with Tiger Woods and play golf all the time. <laughs> But that doesn't mean because I would trade places with him willingly, that doesn't mean he should make less money. Correct. And that and and we've got, you know, you've got countless non-athlete students that get scholarships. So they get full rides and stipends. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, who's limiting their earnings and what they can accept from someone? Uh, they can do commercials and act in movies and write books and accept whatever they want from anyone. They can mm -hmm. get help from boosters, the school can hire them, or whatever they want. But somehow an athlete, uh, his or her rights should be limited. And while they're being sold for billions of dollars, I mean, that, that really, it, it, it's so wrong. I think it's wrong to the point of being immoral. And, uh, and I, I understand a little bit why fans are saying, oh, come on, we, you know, I'm not interested in listening to this because they just want their games. 
Yeah. So anything that gets in the way of their games, they don't want. You know, remember we argued a few years ago over the stipend. You know, the stipend. Yep. We're going to have to cancel sports, and oh my god, the stipend. Mm -hmm. You know, something that would have been unthinkable years ago and an egregious violation of NCAA rules. And every college president and athletic director was out there going, "Oh, this is going to ruin everything," and you know, bankruptcies looms and all this doomsday nonsense. And they <laughs> passed the stipend, and everything's great. It's not a problem. And uh, you know, the the name, image, and likeness is the same thing. And uh, the players are waking up to their value. Uh, you know, we'll see. The, the only leverage the players have is whether they play. So they're going to have to withhold services in order to get what they want. But uh, the NCAA has an opportunity to do the right thing. They're just not going to do it because they don't want to. Yeah, as much as it doesn't make sense, you put it that way, and it makes a ton of sense. Jay Bill is here with us, NCAA college basketball analyst for ESPN. Make sure you follow him on social media, on the Twitter, at Jay Billis, and on IG or the Gram or Instagram, whatever the cool kids are calling it nowadays, at Real Deal Jay Billis. Um, Jay, I, I, I got a, just a couple more questions for you. I don't want to hold you too long. One, uh, before we get into uh, the withdraw, the names of some of the guys I would draw from, from the NBA draft this year, Jay Billis is infamous to me for um, – having zero followers on Twitter, I'm sorry, following zero people on Twitter, having a ton of followers. I want to get kind of a, a little bit of understanding or overstanding as to why or how that even became about. And I know that you um, are also a huge, huge fan of, um, of young Jeezy and always putting something out from one of his verses that you kind of pull that out. Where, where did that whole idea even come from? Well, first on the zero followers thing, uh, when when I first started on Twitter, you know, my wife was the one that that encouraged me to get on it. I, I didn't think Twitter would be worth my time or anyone else's when uh, when I first got on it, and I didn't frankly understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. So when uh, when it was pointed out, or when I found out that people were, you know, sort of uh, asking, well, why I didn't know, like you know, following people, it was for news and you know to get all these different perspectives. So when uh, when people started coming at me with this idea of you know you you too good to follow anybody, I thought that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes I am, and uh, and so I started kind of jerking everybody around on that and made a joke of it. But I have another account where I use oh. Twitter, you know, for for that, um, and I use it more like my Instagram account where I've got a bunch of bunch of people I follow, and, mm -hmm. and but I don't really get my news from from Twitter that much. Mm -hmm. um, because what's trending isn't necessarily what's best or most interesting. Uh, but I do, I have, I have an account where I follow a thousand different accounts and all that. So it's, it's fun. Um, the second part on, on Jeezy was I, uh, uh, you know, I'm a big music fan. So I, I listen to a lot of different types of music and I've, I've listened to hip hop since and, and rap since I was in high school. Uh, but that was a long time ago. Like I was in high school in the late seventies, early eighties. So the first, sort of time I ever, you know, understood that like rap music, this is awesome, was uh, the Sugar Hill Gang, you know, Rapper's mm -hmm. Delight and all that stuff. I knew every mm -hmm. word of that song. But um, when, I don't know how many years ago, it was actually through, we were at Michigan State with game day and Draymond Green was uh, was wearing some headphones while he was warming up. And, and I can't remember whether he was on set or came by the set because uh, it's been so long, but uh, we asked him what he was listening to on his headphones, and he says, Young Jeezy. And so Hubert Davis, who's now back with the University of North Carolina as an assistant, had said to me, do you, you know, do you listen to Jeezy on your, you know, back then it was probably iPod. Those were iPod days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and is that on your your iPod? And I said, actually, it is. <laughs> and, uh, and so there were some people who didn't believe me on Twitter, and I went back and forth, and I had quoted some lyrics, I think. And and the got to go to work thing came from there and it just mm -hmm. somehow became a thing. And, uh, and I've kind of done it a lot since then. Before we get you off here, I'm going to have to get Jay Billis to uh, recite one of those lyrics from, from young Jeezy. I want to remind the people uh, that you can always feel free to comment below, as you can see it down there on the ticker below with questions and opinions. If you have any, always want to uh, let the people know the viewers and the followers that you can always follow along and, and, and throw out a couple of uh, different opinions there as well. Um, you, you spoke about 
being at Michigan State during that time. And obviously there's been a, some players that have decided to kind of come back to school and some players that decided to forego Michigan State specifically being uh, a, a program that has Aaron Henry coming back for his junior year, Xavier Tillman deciding to leave after, after his junior year um, and the decisions that they have made. They have been particularly a program that has been extremely, extremely hot over the course of the last month or so picking up uh, Imani Bates amongst other players that are top ranked in the country, something we typically don't really see very much from Michigan State. What do you think has really changed? Is it something that Tom Izzo you think has maybe been doing different within his recruiting? It kind of seems like they've been ramping up quite a bit and following along the same lines or footsteps as your, you know, other elite programs, Blue Bloods, Dukes, North Carolinas and Kentuckys and so forth. What do you think that that reason would be now? You know, I don't think it's it's like, that much different. I mean, Michigan State's been recruiting the top players for a long time. And, you know, there have been years where they've gone down to the wire on one player or another, and maybe the maybe the player went to Kansas or Duke or North Carolina or something like that, mm-hmm. where they've been they've finished second on a number of guys and have been right there a million times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they've had their share of 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 players that have come through that were were highly coveted and um, so Tom's always, Tom Izzo has always been a great recruiter, uh, and he's always had great, and, a, and really a blue blood program, uh, in his time there. Uh, you know, they're, I think Michigan state's among a handful and it's only a handful of programs that have experienced that kind of success over the last 20 some years. Correct. So it's really been only, only four or five that are in their league. Um, so I'm not surprised. It's just that, that. You know, I think with some of the some of the programs that we're talking about that have been traditional powers for uh, 40 years rather than sure. 20. Sure. Um, they're, you know, entrenched power in college sports is, is difficult to deal with. And really, I, I'd say in the last in the last 20 years, outside of the, the traditional big shots, um, it's really only been maybe Michigan State, Gonzaga, and depending on how you want to look at Villanova, because Villanova won a championship when I was in college in 1985. 85. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, a Big East program. Um, you know, that's if you include Villanova, that's three programs. And other, other than that, you're talking about, you know, Duke, North Carolina, you know, programs like that. I mean, UCLA hasn't, they, they, they haven't had the experience, the, the, the winning Michigan State has, or Indiana, mm-hmm. or you can name all these programs that sure. that haven't touched what, what Michigan State <laughs> has accomplished. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know that, that sort of this latest hot streak that Tom is on in signing players is any more than, um, you know, they, they've, they've been right there with so many of these guys and established these great relationships, finished second, uh, that, that it, it speaks to, you know, the fact he's changed something. Like he's not changed anything that I know of. He's still the same guy, and uh, he's not let uh, – the way I view it, like Tom has not let success change, change his values or his core. Like he's the same guy, mm-hmm. um, and that's not, that's, that's not the norm. Usually, usually people change a great deal with power. They, uh, their hunger uh, uh, changes. Uh, he hasn't changed really in any way, uh, except his suits are nicer. That's about it. And I, he's probably playing better golf clubs and all that. You know, he's got he's probably got PXGs and spending big money on golf. <laughs> There's quite a few people, Jay, that's up in um in that neck of the woods in Sparty Land. <clears throat> Excuse me, that. You know, they're, they're, they're skeptical as to whether they will or won't see, you know, a player like an Imani Bates, who, you know, a lot of people are saying is going to be, you know, the next generational player after Zion and so forth as to whether he will be seen in a Michigan State uniform or not in the green and white or whether he'll decide to reclassify. And obviously all of that is still yet to be determined um, and keeping it even within the Big Ten. Not only do I want to get your opinion on that, but even keeping it within the Big Ten, the names of the guys have decided to come back. Luca Garza, who, you know, as absolutely dominated the conference, especially this past year, and even extending some of his range on his jump shooting. Uh, Ayo Desumu and Kofi Coburn uh, decided to come back to Illinois. And there's a few other pieces here and there, you know, just in regards to the Big Ten. Uh, what teams or just players in general that you've seen that's kind of caught your eye 
uh, in regards to as we get ready to reach this deadline here within the next hour or so of guys that are deciding to come back to school. And what does that do for some of these programs and where do you put them? Because you mentioned Gonzaga even uh, who got Ayayi coming back for next year as well. Uh, which is a huge, huge piece for them in the way that they've been recruiting has been off the charts as well. But um, even in regards to that, you know, th they've probably got as much pressure to finish the deal next year just as much as anybody, especially if they get some of the big guys like Kispert and some of the others to return. Who has really uh, kind of stuck out to you in some of the decision making over the course of the last 24 to 48 hours? Well, I haven't, I've been reading like you have who's coming back and all that, uh, you know, because there's so much time between now and the draft. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of count most players as gone when they put their name in the draft, even though I know a good many of them are going to come back. Um, and this year was a little bit different because there's so much uncertainty going forward. Like, do you come sure. back to college when you don't know if there's even going to be a college season? Uh, right now, the only, you know, the only one that's proven they can play at least for a short period of time is the NBA. Sure. And so if, if you're looking for an opportunity to play, um, you know, you don't know what the G league is going to go forward, but you do know that the NBA is going to play and, and, uh, uh, you know, you don't know, like as much as I'm hopeful, I don't know that college basketball is going to be up and running in November. And I don't mm -hmm. know that they'll play even when they get to, uh, to January. So that mm -hmm. complicates everything, um, but it, it, it's so difficult. Like one of the things that I think is really odd about the way college basketball is viewed is sort of the value judgments that are placed upon the decision of a young player that somehow, you know, we, we the college basketball literati tends to look down on one and done players. And I've never understood that. You know, they don't do that in any other any other endeavor. You know, you kind of celebrate those that have the opportunity to go on and realize a dream. Yep. Uh, but with regard to college college basketball, it's this horrible horrible thing. Um, and somehow, you know, somehow we look down upon those players. Um, you know, the Big Ten seems like they were they had the most really good players. I think that had declared. Um, and you know, nobody had the opportunity to go through a combine. So they got everything that was done was basically done virtually. Uh, so they had much less information and I don't know whether that's going to lead to more cautious decisions mm -hmm. or lead to more bad decisions or what, but Illinois benefited by having Coburn and, and Zuma back and Iowa mm -hmm. was the biggest, uh, beneficiary because Garza will be the number one candidate for national player of the year next year. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I think Michigan State benefited by getting Aaron Henry back. Um, so we can, you know, you can debate whether it was the right decision for certain players to stay in. But as long as they had the information that they need and and they are comfortable with the fact that they're starting, deciding to start their pro careers and, and they can't come back, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm good with it. Uh, the, the, the only problem I have is I, I think it would be really smart of the NCAA to say, if you get drafted and you don't like your draft position, come on back. Yeah. Like, well, you know, go through the draft. And if you're, if yeah. you're not happy with your draft position, we'd love to have you back. Mm -hmm. Like if we really believe in education, why would it's we a win -win. say to people, mm -hmm. yeah, why would you say to young people, well, well, you said you wanted to be a pro, so <laughs> we don't want you anymore. Um, that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And if we really have their best interests at heart, why would we not want them back? Yeah, it doesn't mean the school has to take them back, but, but somebody might. Uh, somebody would want them, so let them come back. And uh, uh, but we don't we don't seem to want to do that, and it, it never makes any, it's, that's never made any sense to me. That makes for a really good point, Jay. As we get ready to uh, conclude, which I'm gratefully that for you to be able to uh, come on here, and you were just talking about the one and dones, and uh, I'm, I can't I don't really have necessarily the answers behind why you know some of the highest ranked recruiting classes over the course of the last handful of years or so hasn't won national championships because the way we've seen it, they've all been having, you know, more experienced and veteran leadership, you know, between Villanova and Virginia uh, and a couple others, you know, that, that, that have gone on and won these national championships without these elite, you know, one and done uh, type prospects and talents. I want to throw this one out there to you real quick, Jay. Now this one here, and you got to excuse the kind of crazy graphic here, 
happened in 2012. You could probably see I had a lot more hair on my head at that time. That was my first opportunity. It was a college game day out at Michigan State. By the way, a good buddy of mine named Jack Ebling, who's also a mentor of mine, tells me to tell you hello. That was my first time having a credential independently um, at that time uh, in East Lansing. And I was just as happy as all get out. You were obviously a huge, huge part of that. I still talk to Hubert Davis to this day. He's a mentor of mine as well. So I want to say thank you for that opportunity. And thank you for this opportunity as well. I'm really, really happy that you had a chance to join us. No, it's my pleasure. And thanks for showing that picture. We both had hair back then. That was the good old days. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, so much. I really, really appreciate you. And thank you so much for coming on. Great being with you, Deshaun. Thank you. Thank you. Jay Billis, everybody, ESPN college basketball analyst, uh, as well as CBS sports analyst, um, bringing up some really good points about uh, quite a few different things that, um, you know, we may have thought of before, may not have necessarily thought of before, but um, giving us some very you know, bright perspective and having the opportunity for him to be able to join us and bring in his wisdom. As we know, he's very, uh, a very, very intelligent guy. Um, I'm thankful that, you know, he, he could come on and kind of educate us a little bit. I told some people to make sure that you feel free to come on and comment below with your questions and, and, and or uh, opinions and such. And we definitely had a, quite a few people that did that. So I'm gonna make sure that I bring in a couple of folks, uh, John Crichton, good buddy of mine saying, Deshaun Tate, my dude. And that's my dude as well. <laughs> right back to you. Um, had a birthday yesterday, age 36. And I'm glad that, you know, not everybody had the opportunity to, uh, see this age. So I want to make sure I say this during my podcast. I'm grateful for it. Uh, a lot of people didn't even have the opportunity to see half of this age. I can't imagine exactly what some of the up and coming or that next generation that's following generation X is they're kind of in their history books or whatnot. And they're going to kind of going to be looking back at uh, the year of 2020 when they're in school doing their work. Like what in the hell was y'all doing back then in 2020 to where all this crazy stuff was just kind of going on. And that just kind of goes to show how thankful and appreciative I am for being able to see this new age because um, you know, this is one of those things where I think we're going to look back. We're going to tell our kids. We're going to tell our grandkids um, that if you made it through 2020 to 2021, like you were really blessed. Like, I think we all know someone who's either had the coronavirus or passed away from the coronavirus. And if not, you know, know someone that knows someone that has uh, and all things considered being able to see the age that I am now on the other side of my thirties heading towards the forties. Um, of course, I'm not rushing that process, but it's certainly been a blessing in its own way. Uh, Julio ATL saying dope. Um, Jahi Whitehead, and I appreciate all these guys for chiming in. Some of them colleagues, some of them friends, some of them I have no idea who they are, but I am thankful that they did the right thing. They go on, they subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I beat people over the head with that on a regular basis. Tell your mama, tell your grandmama, tell your aunt. Tell your auntie or whatever you call it. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell everybody. Make sure that you go and subscribe to the Tate's Take podcast. Anywhere you find your favorite podcast, Stitcher, Red Circle, iTunes, um, Google Podcasts, Spotify, the whole nine. If you got an Android, if you got an Apple or anything in between, make sure that you go and subscribe. Just click on that search box, hover over that little magnifying glass. And type in there, Tate's Take, T-A-T-E, apostrophe S, T-A-K-E, and be sure to subscribe. Help me out with some subscribers. I my, my wish yesterday at turning age 36 was that I needed 36 new subscribers, and I'm almost there. Not quite there yet, but I'm getting a little bit closer. And you, yes, you, I can use your help definitely doing that as well. Rob Hamilton chimed in a good buddy of mine, mentor in his own right, good friend, former colleague, lifelong friend, saying go Blue Devils. And uh, that that's not enough to end our, our long our long friendship. Um, but, uh, but, but definitely overly thankful and grateful, appreciative of him as well. And I like to try and go through all these because I like to show my people some love. You can always see that uh, your comments are always greatly appreciated when they pop up here. Also, Rob Hamilton saying, my man, nice get. 
Uh, two of where'd it go? I just had it here a second ago, but I want to make sure I get through these because I'm always thankful for the people. Uh, Rob Hamilton, I'm also saying two of my favorite people right here. Big fans of you both. I'm so happy. I, I, I hope I, I can speak for Jay Billis at this point and say thank you, but I'm crazy thankful for a guy like Rob Hamilton as well. Marshall Young, who is a regular listener, avid watcher of Tate's Take. She also did the right thing by prescribing to Tate's Take, uh, prescribing, subscribing to Tate's Take as well. Um, saying, what's the G League? Um, the Gatorade League. So it's formerly the NBDL, which was the NBA Developmental League. Now the G League because it's sponsored by Gatorade. So if, I, I know people that are saying what uh, or, or saying G League and they had no idea where it was even coming from. So a uh, very good question. And hopefully I had the opportunity to answer that. Um, Keith Tate, no surprise here. Uh, dang, I missed it. I was going to ask him what his favorite Jeezy quote. Ah, I was the one that missed it. OK, yeah, I'm going to have to get him back on or see if he can retweet some stuff and see what it, exactly what his favorite Jeezy quote was. But um. Thankful, uh, thankful for him and obviously Kevin Keys. And of course, this being my shout out to conclude to all of these people who, who chimed in and even the people that are going to listen later to Tate's Take, uh, as well as um, those who are currently uh, looking on already and watching uh, Charles Richards saying, hey, what up, though? Hey, Charles Richards. Um, I want, I want to close out and, and finish with saying this subscribe yesterday. Everyone go do it. My dude, Rob Hamilton, helping me with some promotion. Subscribe yesterday. Everybody go and do it. Listen to Rob Hamilton. This is what I like to think is the most informational, educational, um, and the best basketball podcast, um, that, you know, that, that you will find best basketball content in the form of a podcast that you will find. So if it's played on that hardwood, 94 feet long, 50 feet wide, 22 feet and one and one quarter inches out on the perimeter, that's being college in the NBA, 23 feet and one quarter inch out on the perimeter for the logo. And if that rim is 10 feet tall, then this is exactly where you're going to find it. And plus, on top of that, you never, ever know exactly who I'm going to have on. So we brought on the voice of the Atlanta Hawks play-by-play -play announcer. Make sure that you go and check that out. Um, that being Bob Rathbun. Brought him on a couple of days ago. That was one that you don't want to miss if you're an Atlanta Hawks fan or just an NBA fan and talking about the bubble 30 teams versus 22 teams that they have now in Orlando. Um, and talking a little bit about Trey Young and just the growth of the Atlanta Hawks, what you can expect from them next year. Um, definitely want to go back and check that one out. Uh, so pay attention to my dude, Rob Hamilton, right here. Tell everybody to go and make sure that they're subscribing to the podcast. Uh, hat on Jay Billis today. You can always go back and find that as well. If you came in and uh, a little short on the short end of the interview today. And of course, tomorrow, told you guys, you can always Always, 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 this is me teasing, by the way, what we call it in the radio world, um, a guest for tomorrow. Rick Kamla is coming on as well. Um, Channel 86, NBA TV, NBA radio. I'm sorry, not NBA TV, NBA radio, excuse me, uh, for Sirius XM give and go that he does every single day between 1 and 4 p. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so always in huge support for my dude, man. He's going to be coming on with us tomorrow. So make sure that you go let the people know where they can find the best content at. We'll talk to him about the NBA. Going forward, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the guys that did decide to withdraw their names from, um, from the NBA draft. Uh, because as we are approaching 58, yeah, 58 minutes now away um, from the actual deadline. So we'll get into quite a few other people. But and I'm going to break a lot of these guys down for you on some upcoming shows that I do have just a couple of them I want to get through today. Uh, so I don't want to get too long winded, but these are the list of players so far who has decided to. Um, these are the, a list of a few of the players that did decide to, to come back, uh, to school and some of the guys that, that chose not to do exactly that. So I want to make sure that I educate you guys and give you guys some heads up. And if you're watching and you're not quite sure just yet, or you're riding in your car and you don't know exactly who decided to declare and who decided not to, here goes your list. Jordan Adams, um, 
Abdul Adu is another one. Derek Austin from Boise State. That's going to be really, really big for them. We talked about Joe Ayayi already. Uh, Jared Butler from Baylor. Baylor being a team that was really, really huge uh, this this year and kind of fell by the wayside a little bit towards the tail end of uh, the season, but certainly bringing Jared Butler back for next year is going to give them an opportunity to potentially be ranked uh, number one to start the season. Marcus Carr, we talked about Kofi Coburn, David Collins. You may not have heard the name, but he's a ball player out there in South Florida at USF. Jalen Crutcher, who was probably not getting nearly as much uh, recognition as I think that he certainly deserved. Um for what Dayton did this year, because everybody was always talking about Obi Toppin so much. Jalen Crutcher was a huge, huge piece of a lot of their success. Darius Days from LSU is going to be really big. We already talked about Ayo Desumu. Good to see Dexter Dennis coming back as well. And this dude, Ayo Desumu, I'm a little surprised that he didn't stay in the draft because this dude is serious. Between he and Coburn, inside, outside duo, arguably the best in the country that's going to be coming back for next year. I think that that's going to be really, really huge for the Illini, and I told some people to watch out for them earlier this year. Some people listened and some people didn't. So um, I think that they had some really, really good things cooking down the stretch and that they could have potentially made a run in the NCAA tournament. Luca Garza, like um, like Billis was just kind of speaking on, uh, being arguably or inarguably the preseason national player of the year, the way that he dominates. If you don't know Luca Garza at Iowa, you need to be paying more attention to college basketball because that dude is not only a load up front, but he's certainly the real deal as well. Aaron Henry from Michigan State, we talked about that a little bit. Dejan Giroux from Houston, between he and Grimes uh, being in position to now having them both return, maybe win conf um being able to win the AAC the American Athletic Conference especially with UConn going back to the Big East I think that's going to be big Isaiah Joe who is a straight up scorer and a really really good defender never seen him play before you want to keep your eyes and ears open for him on that at Arkansas so these are just a a, a few names of some guys that uh, are deciding to keep their name I'm sorry, uh, to withdraw their name from the NBA draft and return back to the collegiate level. Corey Kispert from Gonzaga, a huge reason why they'll likely be the preseason number one. Herbert Jones, nothing but athleticism. If you want to see a guy who's athletic, believe me, he between he and um, and LSU's um, Emmett Williams, those are two guys that I think are inarguably the best uh college basketball athletes in terms of an athlete uh you wouldn't want to make sure that you see who those guys are as well isaiah livers returns to michigan that's really big for them trey man who i think not only just necessarily being a little bit undersized um but definitely is a big piece to this florida basketball team and even though they didn't live up to the expectations last year they uh, definitely with getting some players back and eh, one or two transfer here and there. But I still think that they're going to have some really good players that are going to be turn coming back. And in, in addition to Keontae Johnson, uh, Remy Martin comes back to Arizona State, which I think is absolutely huge because you do have um, you do have a uh, a player in Christopher uh, that is on the team as well and deciding to go to to um, to play alongside his brother at Arizona State. That's going to really be huge. Isaiah Miller. I know that I mentioned between Williams at LSU and Herbert Jones. If I had to replace one player with Herbert Jones to be the most athletic guy in college, without questions, Isaiah Miller uh, out of Newton, Georgia, Newton High School, former teammate of Ashton Hagen's on the high school level as well. Um, and he's really big for that team that was looked like it could have been on its way uh, to an NCAA tournament. John Petty, who feels like he'd been in the league forever and may have been better off leaving after his freshman year, uh, actually coming back um, to college, Xavier Pinson being another one of them. And I feel like I'm missing one more as I'm kind of scrolling through my list a little bit. Um, McKinley Wright from, from Colorado. Uh, definitely did himself some good. They had a really good year this year and obviously going to have some very, very 
good pieces coming back for them as well. And they were certainly within contention for the Big 12 this past year. So uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to go and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening. Anywhere that you find your favorite podcast, make sure that you go and subscribe there. Tate's Take, T-A-T-E-S-T-A-K-E. Um, make sure that you do that. That is iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Red Circle, Stitcher, anywhere you find your favorite podcast. So if you got an iPhone and you're like, ah, oh, I can't find it, and you got Android, make sure that you go to Spotify and Google Podcasts. If you don't have the Android phone and you have the iPhone, make sure that you go to iTunes and Apple Podcasts to make sure that you find Tate's Take again, the best, most informational, and most educational basketball content in the form of a podcast. We'll have Rick Kamala back tomorrow, I believe at 11 a.m. And just to confirm that, make sure that you follow along on all social media platforms at Tate's Take Hoops, T-A-T-E-S-T-A-K-E-H-O-O-P-S, hashtag where basketball lives.